uh, now that we know what are the uh, fine aspects and what are the differences between uh, provisioning voice over IP on a packet based network like IP uh, versus uh, PSTN. If you are interested in providing a very good quality uh, audio uh, on NGN, then how QS can help in this regard and how QS is actually implemented uh, by different uh, uh, network elements and different entities in the NGN uh, fun uh, functional architecture both at the transport stratum and the service stratum. So we'd look at quickly at the handover uh, type and then we are going to look at how uh, as a requirement a voice over IP uh, can take benefit from the QS services available in the NGN architecture. So first and foremost uh, once voice, voice for IP is, is, is provided on fixed uh, networks like uh, uh, which do not require any mobility, uh, the, the quality of service is essentially going to remain the same. So that's not much of a concern. The, the problem actually uh, arises when we have mobile devices because in mobile devices the attachment point or the, uh, um, the, the access link actually keeps on uh, delinking that is it, it, it keeps on changing and uh, the attachment point actually moves from one network premises to the other so it means that the session has to continue in this case uh, the quality of service uh, consideration becomes very important so the once a mobile or a user equipment changes its location it's known as the mobility and mobility is handled through handovers if, if the technology from the departing uh, network and the arriving network is the same, it's horizontal. And the devices which can, the user equipments which can handle this are the single mode devices. But if the uh, departure and the arrival networks are uh, different in technology, then some kind of vertical handoff is required. And then we have the multimodal or multimode supporting user equipment. Uh, let's look at general architecture for QS enabled voice. Uh, we have uh, two operators. Uh, since we are talking at a binary operation that is movement from one network to the other. So we are we just have two operators. Both of these operators are showing different user equipments. For instance, we have LTE based uh, user on accessing data. We have a Wi-Fi based user and we have a mobile WiMAX user. So you see it's generalized, it is not very specific. Uh, we have uh, service session related control information that is service establishment, service maintenance and service termination. Then we have uh, whenever there's a change in uh, network attachment, then we have binding update. And in order to run the binding update uh, successfully and in order to use it, some kind of uh, discovery mechanism is required to discover the foreign network element for that some kind of DNS query has to be run and then we also need some kind of uh, uh, network related control information uh, that would inform the network elements that a new user is in proximity and has to be provided a service so all these are uh, shown to you in different uh, arrowed lines we see here the, the thickness actually is determining the uh, difference between the two so uh, just to recall uh, from the NGN architecture's perspective, uh, we have the uh, uh, network attachment control function, which is closest to the uh, network resources, I mean closer to the physical layer. Then we have the resource admission control function, that is the uh, uh, RSEF. We have mobility management control function and service control function. So uh, you see here that uh, uh, the mobility management control functions are pairing with each other. Uh, likewise, the service control function are pairing with each other through DNS. So it means that uh, there is going to be a, a vertical relationship between the network elements and the functional uh, modules in the engine architecture uh, till the mobility management control function is activated. And the mod mobility management control function is then going to coordinate with the peer mode mobility management control function in the foreign network 
and of course the service has to be provided through the service control function that eventually would also be talking to its own peer. Uh, let's look at the uh, establishment process in a step-by-step -step manner uh, between different engine operators. Uh, we have uh, two operators, operator one and operator two. We have uh, network, uh, we have user equipment uh, one in operator one and user equipment uh, two or user, user B in operator two or operator B. So let's start from the left hand side. So we, you see here that we've got different layers which are uh, colored differently. Uh, we have uh, the end user functions, transport functions, transport control functions, and service stratum functions. Uh, so we are going to initiate the request uh, as step number one, service is requested uh, from the user equipment. It, it, it is sent to the service stratum function, uh, to the uh, proxy call session control function, uh, which in turn actually talks to the serving uh, call session control function, which in turn asks the interrogating call session control function to forward or uh, establish a service request process as step number two. Then uh, the interrogating call session control function may even have to discover or ask or consult a DNS server uh, to look for the destination call session control function. So it, it, the one interrogating call session control function from the calling party's uh, operator network calls the interrogating uh, call session control function entity of the called network of the called party. So the, the uh, destination interrogating call session control function in turn tells the serving call session control function to discover and contact the proxy call session control function, which in turn contacts the destination uh, user equipment in step number six. Uh, so the service request is received. Now, if the user presses on the accept button or subscribes to the uh, request, then uh, a response is generated. Using the same procedure, uh, the response is sent back to the call, called party. Meanwhile, the request is also initiated to look for the appropriate QoS availability by the underlying network. Uh, for that, the, uh, uh, the resource admission control function uh, is consulted that is going to uh, uh, check if the resources are going to be available. And then correspondingly, the mobility management control function is also activated because it's a different network. So the MMCF and RSCF are going to work in collaboration with each other. Uh, then the service response is sent back to the network from which the request was made. And then the QS setup request is again made now in the operator one uh, using the same procedure. Uh, after uh, doing that, then it means that was the last activity of establishing QoS at the calling network. And after that, the service response is finally sent down to the calling entity, that is the user equipment. Now, this particular process is finished before actual any data transfer can take place. So this is exactly mentioned in here. We've got uh, terminal A that sends service request for VoIP call to user B. Uh, via its own proxy, CSCF, uh, through its serving CSCF, to its interrogating CSCF, but so far everything is in operator A's jurisdiction. Then the uh, operator A interrogating CSCF uh, does DNS uh, lookup to obtain the IP address for the interrogating CSCF in the target network. The receiving interrogating CSCF forwards it, the request for service to the serving call session control function to obtain the uh, contact details of the proxy call session control function because the user is essentially associated with the PCSCF. And after that, the service request is from, sent from uh, A to B, which replies and on return, each proxy call session control function communicates with the resource and admission control function for admission control. With all this uh, finally concluded, we have the resource and admission control function that instructs 
the underlying network to allocate the bandwidth, the resources, the time, uh, the network attachment, because the network attachment actually means the IP address allocation is all going to take place. And then finally, we would see that the user data, that is the thick line, that is voice, would be sent from user equipment one in the first operator to the user equipment two in the second operator.